Hello, welcome to the John C. Livingston Endowed Lecture. I'm Danny McIntosh, Dean of the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences. The college includes 17 schools and departments, approximately 2,300 majors, and over 28,000 alumni. We have hundreds of folks joining us tonight from all over. So to all, the alum all you alumni, welcome home, even if it's only virtually tonight. This event kicks off the week celebrations and what brought many of us to the University of Denver to begin with. A fabulous faculty member challenging us and getting to know wonderful students who are engaged in the community. We're also grateful to be joined today by a number of current and former CAUSE Alumni Council members. Senior Vice Chancellor for Advancement, Val Lawton, Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, Todd Adams, and Provost Mary Clark. Thank you all so much for making the time to be here. Included in the college's Keystone Strategic Plan is a vision of students engaged in Keystone experiences, applying what they learn in their classes in the community. Also part of our strategic plan is support from the Madden Center for Innovation in the Liberal and Creative Arts to support faculty innovation. Tonight you'll hear about Costa de Paz Learning Community, a program that has come out of both these initiatives of our strategic plan. Note that through this virtual platform, you can see and hear us, but we cannot see and hear you. We'll be taking questions through the question and answer um, process or, or button on your, on your screen. So if you have questions at various times, we'll ask for them and you should just go ahead and put questions in there and we'll be relaying them to the panelists. You can also put in the chat box if you'd like where you're from, what your association is from, with the college, but all the questions will be through the Q&A. We're also recording tonight's lecture. Now a little bit of background. The annual John Livingston Endowed Lecture Series invites a College of Arts, Humanities and Social Science faculty member to present her work to the broader community. The late Professor John Livingston was an esteemed professor of history and chair of the department. He was not only a colleague, but he was also a dear friend of many DU faculty, staff, and students. He was the heart of the department. This lecture honors not only John, but also his wife, Nancy. Those who knew John and Nancy know that they work together as a true partnership. John and Nancy came up with the idea for this lecture series when he was ill, and they were thinking of a way to honor his legacy at DU. And this was a natural extension of the enjoyment of the intellectual enterprise, celebrating faculty and the students and alumni of the university. Nancy is here with us tonight. For years, Nancy has continued to carry forward John's academic legacy by being an active member of our community and by helping us with a wonderful lecture series. Nancy, thank you so much for the years of support and all that you've brought to the college and the university. Now I'd like to introduce our esteemed lecturer for tonight. We're honored to have with us Dr. Elizabeth Escobedo, an Associate Professor of History here at DU. Professor, professor Escobedo's research focuses on the experiences of second generation women of immigrant and migrant populations during times of war. She enjoys teaching a wide range of classes, um, including in US history, including modern America, the Latinx and Chicanx experience, women and gender, and the history of race and ethnicity in America. Professor Escobedo is currently the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, and she oversees the Critical Race and Ethnic Studies minor program. She's the author of the award-winning book, From Coveralls to Zoot Suits, The Lives of Mexican-American Women on the World War II Homefront. Her current book project is a history of Mexican-American and Puerto Rican women in the World War II US military. With the support of the Madden Center, Professor Escobedo and faculty colleagues from across the college launched a, launched a set of service learning courses to partner with Casa de Paz, an Aurora nonprofit that offers housing, meals, visits, and transportation to immigrants recently released from immigration detention and help support them on their journeys home and to reunite their families. Through these courses, college students receive hands-on volunteer experiences, 
including visiting migrants at the detention center, serving as hosts or companions to help migrants reconnect with family members upon their release, and providing hospitality to migrants at the CASA. In doing so, they connect concepts learned in the classroom with real world problem solving and teamwork. Since 2018, 160 CAUSE students have taken courses in the immigration cluster and volunteered at Casa de Paz. We look forward to hearing more about race and immigration and about the Casa de Paz experience. Welcome, Professor Escobedo. Greetings all. Thank you so much for being here tonight. And thank you, Dean McIntosh, for your very generous introduction and, and your kind words. And to all of you spending the evening with us, your presence is so much appreciated and we appreciate you being here. I also wanna thank the team behind the scenes that has made this event possible, the talented Chris Naley and Jennifer Garner. And then of course, a special thank you to Nancy Livingston for her continuous support for the liberal arts and for keeping John's memory alive through the sharing of scholarship and critical thinking with a wide audience. It is immense honor for me to be here tonight under the Livingston name, thank you. I'll start by giving a brief layout of this evening's program as we'll be providing two opportunities for questions and answers in order to mix things up a bit given our strange and, and virtual remote experience um, and to keep that more engaged. I'll speak for 20 minutes and then we'll have time for questions uh, then. And then I will introduce our next guests, uh, Sarah Jackson, Executive Director of Casa de Paz and Carly Howenstein, DU alumna 2019 and former participant in DU's Casa de Paz Learning Community, a collective that gives students the opportunity to take immigration courses in service learning partnership with Casa de Paz. Carly and Sarah will each speak for 15 minutes and then you'll have the opportunity to ask them questions as well. So as alluded to in my, my introductions, in 2016, I reached out to Sarah Jackson, founder of Casa de Paz, to see if I might partner with her for a new 20th century immigration course that I was hoping to offer for the Department of History with a service learning component. Sarah, as you will see, being the incredibly open and generous individual that she is, eagerly jumped at the opportunity to have DU students volunteer at the CASA, and our partnership began. As I started to conceptualize and plan the course, the scholarship kept bringing me back to one theme time and time again, and that is the ways in which the quote-unquote illegality of immigration in the 20th century United States was and is defined largely by race. Students who would volunteer with Casa de Paz, visiting migrants in detention and supporting migrants at Casa as they made their way back to their families would see this reality in full relief as immigrants of color are much more likely to be held in detention facilities and to undergo deportation proceedings. Nativism and racism have played an integral role in debates over immigration policy and the consequences of those policies have been much more disadvantageous to people defined as non-white than those considered to be white. Looking back at history shows a direct through line as to how exactly this happens. Now I should note that my time here tonight is limited given that we will have multiple speakers and that means that there will be a number of trends and peoples that I simply won't be able to focus on, including refugees, for instance. But my goal is to provide some telling examples of the ways in which race operates in our immigration system in the 20th century United States. And as the work of historians like Erica Lee, Carrie Lytle, Kelly Lytle Hernandez, sociologists Tanya Goles Bosa, May Nye, they all make clear that the history of US immigration restriction and detention and deportation is by and large a history of race, as race has deeply influenced who is defined and policed as having an unlawful presence in the United States and thereby detainable and deportable. 
So in the contemporary United States, it seems completely natural that we would enforce our borders and regulate the entry of people into this country. In fact, it's very hard for us to imagine a time when this didn't happen. And yet for the first 100 years since the founding of the United States, there was no border patrol. Passports and visas were not required to enter the United States, even though large numbers of immigrants were entering at that time. And so in other words, quote unquote, illegal immigration did not exist because there were no significant restrictions on the immigration process. But when the United States does begin to pass immigration laws at the end of the 19th century, these laws are overtly racialized and express a very clear preference for people from Northern and Western Europe, particularly those deemed white, Anglo-Saxon, and Protestant. In the 1850s, for instance, the arrival of thousands of Chinese immigrants into California provokes tremendous nativist sentiment among whites. And these sentiments are eventually translated into public policy. White workers in the United States, US West in particular, regard Chinese migration as a threat to jobs. And in response to their demands, Congress passes the Exclusion Act of 1882, which prohibits Chinese laborers for entering the United States for the next 10 years. Congress extends and expands the act until the 1940s, making the 1880s to the 1940s the age of Chinese exclusion. Additionally, the Chinese Exclusion Act was the first law used to deport an immigrant from the United States. And alongside the federal courts, the legislation deems Asians racially ineligible for naturalization. Exclusion thus defines Asians as permanent foreigners and in specifically excluding a group because of race and because of class, the act sets the stage for 20th century immigration policy which had both overt and covert class biases. Restrictive trends continue in the conservative climate after World War I, when for the first time, the United States imposes numerical limits on immigration. In spite of the fact that in the 1900s, especially the early 1900s, you had hundreds of thousands of immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe providing cheap, unskilled labor that made possible the nation's industrial and urban expansion, people born in the United States complained that these newcomers like Italians, Slavics, Poles, were stealing jobs, that they were bringing disease and criminality and were incapable of ever truly becoming quote unquote American. And given that these immigrants were not Anglo-Saxon Protestants, but rather Catholics and Jews and by and large non-English speakers, they were viewed as part of an alien culture, the degraded races of Europe. Amidst this nativist sentiment, we see a revival of the Ku Klux Klan and eugenicists sound alarms that Anglo-Saxons might soon become a minority in their own land. You can see these very racialized depictions in a number of political cartoons of the time. This one runs in Life magazine in 1893 reads an interesting question, how long it will it be before the rats own the garden and the man gets out? And we see quite clearly that it is Uncle Sam who is sleeping in the garden that is overrun by vermin who are depicted in very stereotypical imagery of Southern and Eastern European populations. What is interesting is that rather remarkably, we see the 1924 Act creating a quota system that significantly cuts down on the number of foreign-born populations from Southern and Eastern Europe. It also bars immigrants who are ineligible for citizenship, including South and East Asians, Indians, Japanese, Chinese, that had been deemed ineligible for citizenship on racial grounds by the Supreme Court. 
What is remarkable, however, is that in spite of vociferous objections, these quotas do not apply to countries of the Western Hemisphere, like Mexico. And this is by and large in deference to powerful agribusiness interests and agricultural labor needs. Agribusiness convinces Congress that the nation needs a cheap supply of Mexican laborers and that given their proximity to the United States, to the border, Mexicans would simply come to the United States to work, return to Mexico when that work was complete, not causing any sort of permanent threat to American society and culture. Congress does, does give in to anti-immigrant forces, however, by expanding requirements for people from the Western Hemisphere to pay head taxes and visa fees. So these new immigration requirements do not interrupt the total labor flow from Mexico, but it does reduce the number of Mexicans who are migrating to the United States legally. The Border Patrol, noted here, is created this very same year in 1924. So while Mexicans were not included in the 1924 quota restrictions, the creation of the Border Patrol and of immigration inspectors does facilitate the deportation of Mexicans. Many Mexicans who at this time are fleeing economic and political instability in Mexico immigrate to the United States without paying the fees to obtain the required documents. It's expensive. They help meet the demand for low wage labor in the West, but they are also in the United States in violation of immigration law and therefore were deemed deportable. With the advent of the Great Depression of the 1930s, the more plainly racist character of Mexican illegality and deportability becomes abundantly manifest. In the 1930s, the Immigration and Naturalization Service mounts a repatriation campaign in response to skyrocketing amounts of unemployment during the Great Depression. Mexican immigrants and their U.S.-born children, U.S.-born Mexican citizens alike, were systematically excluded from employment and economic relief, as this was considered the exclusive preserve of quote-unquote deserving Americans. These abuses culminate then in forcible mass deportation of at least 500,000 Mexican migrants, as well as many of their U.S. citizen children. And then you have quote unquote voluntary repatriation where individuals are talked into boarding trains and returning to Mexico of about 85,000 or more. So notably Mexicans are expelled with no regard to legal residence, to US citizenship or even birth in the United States. They are expelled simply for being Mexicans. This sort of revolving door immigration strategy where we welcome Mexicans for their labor, but then expel them during periods of economic downturn and increased nativist hysteria is a mainstay of the 20th century. During World War II, for instance, the US government in a dramatic reversal of the mass deportations of the 1930s looks to solve labor shortages by importing Mexican laborers to work in the fields and railroad yards of the United States. These laborers are known as braceros, literally abrazos, arm. Between 1942 and 1964, approximately 4.6 million contracts were signed by Mexican males, allowing them to come to the United States, work on a short-term basis, that usually last about six months to 18, or six weeks to 18 months. But with this influx of Bracero laborers comes a rise in undocumented immigration as well, both through defections from the program, through recruitment of undocumented laborers by growers. Many Braceros that return to Mexico describe the conditions, the opportunities, the comparatively high wages that are available in the United States to their Mexican brethren. Additionally, the bureaucratic red tape of the Bracero program forces Mexican workers to choose the easy alternative of crossing the border without proper documentation. Mexican workers could save money, waiting time, travel expense by doing so. And likewise, 
American growers by hiring undocumented labor could save money by evading minimum wage and employment standards and other restrictions of the Becerra program, including bonding and contracting fees. This period of an official open border with Mexico soon culminates rather predictably in the 1954 to 1955 expulsion of at least 2.9 million undocumented Mexican migrant workers under a militarized dragnet nativist hysteria of a very pejoratively labeled federal, oper federal operation known as quote, Operation Wetback. So named for those who crossed the Rio Grande to make their way into the United States. As you can see here in this article, the language that is used to describe these in, in individuals includes invasion, an unending, uncontrolled stream. And the newspaper and TV coverage consistently terms undocumented immigrants as the illegal hordes or their arrival, as I said, as invasions. Increasingly, the government considers them a threat to the social and political stability of the country and responds accordingly with this mass deportation campaign. What is important to recognize here comparatively, however, is that for Europeans, the time period that we are discussing provides a number of opportunities for the undocumented to legalize their status. In 1940, for instance, Congress authorizes the suspension of orders of deportation in cases of hardship, which it defined as, quote, serious economic detriment to the immigrant's immediate family. But when Mexicans applied for relief from deportation based on this federal hardship exemption, they are routinely denied. Officials callously determine that deportation could not cause a hardship for non-Europeans, employing the faulty logic that because many non-European immigrants were low paid laborers, they were unable to offer significant financial support to their families and thus their deportation could not cause hardship. Suspension of deportations in the 1940s and 1950s were also overwhelmingly conducted for immigrants of European origin, not Mexicans. Governors would pardon potential deportees, especially in areas where European immigrants were numerous and had some political influence. Mexicans rarely received these pardons. So thus it became possible to unmake the illegality of Italians and Poles and other European undocumented immigrants through the power of administrative discretion. Moreover, we know that in the post-World War II era, European ethics, ethnics were moving into suburbs. They were accessing equal education and they were intermarrying with other groups, all opportunities that were not available to Blacks and Mexicans and Asians. And so over time, these processes reconstruct the quote, lower races of Europe into white ethnic Americans. Mexicans on the other hand are still perceived as others and undeserving foreigners. Combined with the construction of Mexicans as migratory agricultural laborers, both documented and undocumented, in the 1940s and 1950s, that perception gives a very powerful sway to the notion that Mexicans have no rightful presence in the United States, it's no rightful claim to belonging. And as historian Tori Hester argues, deport deportability thus deepened the racialization of Mexicans and Mexican Americans alike. Even in light of a massive overhaul of the immigration system in 1965 with the passage of the Hart Seller Act, a law that's main intention was to end racial discrimination in immigration law, race played and continues to play a key role in debates over immigration reform. By the early 1960s, it was widely agreed that American immigration policy needed a complete overhaul 
The national quota system that was put in place in 1924 was seen as discriminatory, especially towards Southern and Eastern European immigrants. And in light of the Cold War, in addition to the civil rights movement, the United States was eager to tout a more democratic immigration system. After several years of debate, Congress passes the 1965 Immigration and Nationality Act. And this, by the way, is the primary immigration act that we still live with today. The law ends the national origins basis of admission to the United States, and it was replaced with a preference system based on immigrants' family relationships with US citizens or legal permanent residents, and to a lesser degree, their skills. The law places an annual cap of 170,000 visas for immigrants from the Eastern Hemisphere, with no country allowed more than 20,000 visas, and for the first time established a cap of 120,000 visas for immigrants for the Western Hemisphere. Three fourths of admissions were those who were arriving in family categories. So immediate relatives like spouses, minor children, parents of adult US citizens. These individuals are all exempt from the caps. 24% of family visas were assigned to siblings of US citizens. In 1976, the 20,000 per country limit was applied to the Western hemisphere as well and smaller numbers are admitted through refugee protection channels. So in creating this legislation, lawmakers express a desire to end discrimination. But in practice, they hoped to facilitate immigration from Europe and to limit, or at the very least, discourage immigration from Asia and Latin America and Africa. In focusing on family preference, legislators assumed, incorrectly, as it turns out, that it would be Europeans who would be coming over to the United States to reunite with family members and thus would preserve the country's European base. In an example of, of extraordinary unintended consequences, however, in the years following, the European economy flourishes, demand from Europeans to immigrate to the United States falls pretty flat. At the same time, interest from non-European countries, many emerging from the end of colonial rule, begin to grow. And so we see immigration from Asia, the Caribbean, and South America grow really dramatically. And if refugees and undocumented immigrants are included, it is Asia and it is Latin America that provides the overwhelming majority of immigrants under the new law. It is worth highlighting what populations are by and large defined as undocumented in these years following the 1965 legislation. Annual numerical quotas for the Western Hemisphere were enacted specifically to restrict immigrants from Latin America. No single country was sending numbers of migrants at all comparable to the level of migration from Mexico. But US officials in 1964 and the Bracero program, and then in 1965, imposed these annual numerical limits on immigrant visas issued to Mexicans and further extend that in 76. Thus the demand and need for migrant labor in the United States does not change, just the law. Eliminating hundreds of thousands of visas annually simply meant that even more Mexicans living in the United States are doing so without the right documents, in spite of Mexico's close proximity and our dependence on Mexican labor. As scholar Nicholas de Genova points out, Mexican migration to the United States is distinguished then by a seeming paradox. While no other country has supplied nearly as many migrants to the United States as has Mexico since 1965, Virtually all major changes in U.S. immigration law during this period have created ever more severe restrictions on the conditions of, quote, legal migration from Mexico, forever marking Mexicans then as illegal, in quotes, with no rightful claim of belonging. 
These practices only grow steadily in the 1980s and 1990s alongside the rise of mass incarceration. Detention rates skyrocket after the passage of the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act, also known as IRA-IRA, mandates detention for immigrants who have been convicted of additional crimes, including nonviolent misdemeanors, so a traffic violation or jumping a subway turnstile, um, driving under the influence, marijuana possession. And we know that laws like these disproportionately affect Blacks and members of the Latinx community, as these populations are much more likely to be stopped and arrested and incarcerated. Moreover, state and local law enforcement agencies are now more likely to be involved in immigration enforcement. As our colleague in the Sturm College of Law, Professor Cesar Garcia Hernandez demonstrates in his own research, the criminal justice system acts like a funnel into the immigration system. Thus, when we look at the demographic makeup of detention centers and see disproportionate rates of immigrants of color, it's important to recognize that this is not happenstance. Rather, policies and laws and practices were created and put into place and shaped these demographics to what they are today. In fact, again, as law professor Garcia Hernandez reminds us in his book, Migrating to Prison, in 1954, President Eisenhower's attorney general announced the decision to shut down major immigration detention centers along both coasts, including Ellis Island. This decision didn't end all immigration detention, but the administration called it part of the quote, humane administration of immigration laws. But in the years following, in the wake of the 1965 Immigration Act, we begin to see an increase of migrants from Asia, dark-skinned and poor migrants from Haiti and Cuba, and the government again turns to the more draconian approach of detention. Here we see the, the Marielle immigrants coming from Cuba during the 1980s. In the Cause Casa de Paz learning community, we now have a number of talented Cause faculty. You can see many of them here, Professor Lisa Martinez, Sergio Macias, Alejandro Cerrón, Lina Parado, teaching courses from a variety of disciplines, including history and sociology and criminology, anthropology, Spanish, courses that study these patterns and their ramifications in great depth. Students in these classes see the impacts of past and current immigration policies in full relief. And they also get to talk and share and support migrants that have been impacted by the laws and attitudes that we've discussed and learned about in class, better understanding and connecting to the human side and the human face of migration. Exposing the ways that race is utilized to marginalize and impoverish and punish and exploit immigrants of color is critical to rethinking our immigration system and making a better future for our country. And we can look to history for sobering and necessary and urgent wisdom on how to do so. Thank you. We have a chance to ask uh, Professor Escobedo some questions now before we move on to the next segment of the presentation. If you have some questions, just type them in the Q&A form and I will be organizing and passing those on to, uh, to Professor Escobedo. So if you have any questions, um, let me know, put them in the Q&A. Um, one question that's come up is a little bit more information about the era of the Cold War. You talked about there continued to be racialization in that period, but there's also a number of, of refugees, um, refugee issues. So I'm wondering what role you see race playing in the history of refugee to play, displaced uh, amidst the Cold War? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question because of course you can't talk about the 20th century without thinking through the Cold War. And so much of what we see in terms of Cold War history and how that impacts who's coming to the United States and who is not 
is based upon U.S. foreign policy. But that doesn't mean that that race fails to play a role there. Um, and I think one of the best examples of this is perhaps um, the experience of immigrants fleeing Cuba. Um, once Castro comes to power, you have an initial wave of Cuban refugees leaving the island, but most of these individuals are lighter skinned and of the middle and upper classes, right? They have the most to lose from Castro's regime. And uh, the United States welcomes them with very open arms, um, highlighting the fact that they are refugees um, and that we are sort of the beacon of hope and that we will help support them in this larger Cold War. Um, and in fact, uh, Cuban immigrants were, were given one of the most significant supports that has ever been given to a, a immigration group, um, and that is um, providing permanent residency, right, after a year of, of living in the United States. Of course, what we see later, um, as we see subsequent waves leaving the island and Castro sort of playing with the United States, you know, saying he's going to open up the prisons and open up the jails and, and let all these criminals into the United States and they're free to go. Um, but many of these later waves of immigrants are people of color and from the working class. And by the 1980s, when we saw the Mario Boatlift arriving in the United States, Americans are much more attuned to um, feeling that immigrants are taking more that they are giving and especially when these are, are immigrants, again, from the working classes and, and who are people of color. And Marielle is when we begin to see immigration detention take off again, which I think is pretty telling given the types of immigrants that are, are, are coming over. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question. Um, there are no African countries identified in the pie chart, Somalia, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Congo, et cetera. Do you have a breakdown of the um, other category? Yeah, let's go ahead and um, get this PowerPoint back up for others to see. Oops. Are you all able to see this now or do I need to share my screen again? I think I'll need to share my screen. Um, the long and short of it is that <laughs> um, I don't have an initial breakdown, but we have seen increasingly since that 1965 act, more and more Africans coming to the United States. And this can perhaps be a question um, that, that Sarah and Carly can get into, um, perhaps not exact numbers, but a number of people that come through the doors of the CASA are those coming from African nations. And in fact, one of um, the, the main directors alongside Sarah uh, immigrated from, from Africa and has played a really significant role in, in CASA's support of, of immigrants. So I apologize, I can't give you exact numbers, but we do see a steady rise. Um, again, especially as more and more African nations are coming out of the yoke of, of colonial rule. Okay, um, thank you. One, one more question. Um, mm -hmm. Professor Escobedo, I understand that Haitians were fleeing political oppression at a similar time as Cubans in the 1980s, a period that gave rise to private detention in the U.S. Were the two nationalities treated differently per immigration policy? Yes. <laughs> um, again, and this is a really good example of, of race um, playing a really significant role here. Um, so we do have Haitians, um, again, as you pointed out here, who are, are leaving Haiti, fleeing um, Francois Duvalier's regime, which of course is quite corrupt, oppressive, brutal, we know this. But on the other hand, he is a staunch cold warrior on the side of the United States, right? He is anti-communist. Um, and so we think about Cold War geopolitics and ideological warfare there is not a welcoming of these individuals in a way that there is from those who are fleeing Castro's regime. And of course, again, because we are looking at black immigrants, there is significant, significant backlash about those Haitians that are, are fleeing the island um, and many stereotypes about the, the diseases that Haitians are bringing with them. So it's a tremendously stark contrast, especially when you make that comparison to Cubans. 
Great, thank you. Why don't we um, um, move on? You mentioned uh, Casa de Paz and Carly and yeah. Sarah, and I think they, um, they're gonna participate in the next part of our, our discussion here. So th thank you, um, Liz, and, and let's move on. Yes, I am, I'm just delighted for the second part of our program here. Um, and I will now introduce Sarah Jackson. Sarah Jackson is the founder and executive director of Casa de Paz which is a hospitality home here in, in Denver and in the, the Aurora area in Colorado. Um, and this is a home that serves families separated by immigrant detention. CASA has a family of over 2000 volunteers. Um, so Sarah has, has brought these people together from all over the community to support immigrants and their loved ones with visits and meals and shelter and transportation and joining them in hope and emotional support going through this arduous process of reunification. Sarah's mission is to help end the isolating experience of immigrant detention, as she calls it, one simple act of love at a time. CASA volunteers have supported and hosted 3,000, this was as of two days ago, so I don't know if the number has changed, 3,133 immigrants from 77 different countries since its opening in 2012. And so it is my great honor to introduce the woman who started it all, Sarah Jackson. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Thank you for inviting me to be part of your evening. I am very, grateful to be having this conversation and I do not take it lightly that we're having this conversation in the middle of an election season and even though we hear immigration a lot in the news and we can make it a political issue at the end of the day really it's about a person a mother a father a husband a wife a son a daughter and for me, understanding that real people were really, not were, are really suffering because of our government's immigration policies didn't sit right in my heart or my soul. And I knew that there was something I could do. I wasn't sure what it was, but I knew there was something that I could do as an individual person to reunite families, specifically ones that had been separated by immigrant detention. So I'm going to show a few pictures and kind of do a little bit of a story time with, with us um, and going to sort of piggyback on what Liz mentioned earlier that there is this, there's this border wall, right? At the Southern border, not covering the entire border but there are sections of the border that have a wall. And families like this that come to the United States, whether they're fleeing war or persecution or poverty, a lot of folks too who are seeking a better life and coming for economic reasons, you know, there's this wall and then you can see on the wall, there's two signs. One sign may say, now hiring, apply here. And then right next to it, there's a sign that says, stay out, you know, no trespassing. So we've got these mixed messages, right? We, we depend on immigrants, we rely on them, and yet we're saying stay, stay out. But if you come, you can work and we'll probably exploit you, but stay out, but come in. So families are caught in the middle of an impossible decision. Do I come in to the United States and, and try to seek uh, safety, whether that's in the form of asylum or other relief, or do I stay home, wherever home is, that could be Mexico, Central America, Africa, Asia, Europe, wherever it is, um, realizing that the threat of, of danger is imminent, and sometimes right there at your door, literally knocking, waiting to kill you. And so oftentimes folks make that very difficult decision to come to the United States seeking safety or life. And upon 
entering the country here you'll see a picture uh, at the border a border patrol officer here and um, they have the opportunity to lawfully present themselves to a border patrol officer and ask for asylum which is a, a, a right that they have that's internationally recognized and one of the things that our government can do and often does is put them in these immigrant detention centers after they have lawfully presented themselves at the border asking for asylum. And folks are not serving sentence for a crime that they have committed. They are being held indefinitely until they can make an appearance in front of their immigration judge. So they're being held in these most immigrants in detention are being held in these for profit prisons. Like Liz mentioned earlier, there's one in Aurora, which is run by a for profit prison company called Geo, which operates prisons all over the world. And they just happen to have one here in Aurora, Colorado. And so Geo will make a contract with ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement to detain immigrants who are in the country, whether asylum seekers or perhaps they were here undocumented and their work was raided or they were pulled over for a traffic violation and found to be undocumented, even though they've been living in the United States for 15, 20, 50 years. If you are in the custody of ICE, then you can be placed in one of these for-profit prisons. And right now, where coronavirus is, is rampant in this country, inside of one of these immigrant detention centers or a prison in general, you are more than three times, you are three times more likely to contract the virus than if you were not in a prison, which makes a lot of sense, right? Because when you're in a closed, confined, enclosed, confined space, there's no way to properly do physical distancing or social distancing. And so I actually want to see if my internet will allow us. I'm going to play a short clip. And these, this is an inside look inside of a detention center. These are some immigrants who were detained in the detention and in a detention center in Louisiana. And they started protesting against their detainment because they were being held for prolonged periods of time and were being treated terribly while they were in this prison. And so they they used their voice, even though it was scary for them to do so because they knew that retaliation happens and it doesn't just happen occasionally, it happens a lot, but they were brave enough to speak out against the way that they were being treated. And so here is an inside look inside one of these detention centers and the message that these men wanted us to hear. We are really suffering. Please, you people should really do help us. Anybody who can help us, do help us. We are suffering in here. The fact that we are speaking like this, we are seeing our faces, we are really suffering. We are really suffering. We are suffering. We are suffering. It is really hell in here. It's hell in here. They don't even give you the opportunity to speak out because we are scared right now that if you want to speak out, they might catch you and go lock you up. We are scared to speak out right now. That's how they made it. They've made it like it's, it, it's like a slave under a master who has no place to go, nowhere to go. That's how we are right now. We are slaves under the master, under, under the master with his eyes. We, we try for our voices to be heard. The facility caught all of us, all of us, the Africans here, and locked us up in the solitary confinement for over one week each. They locked us up just because we went on hunger strike so that our situation can be addressed. And, and also, when we were locked up in solitary confinement, we stayed there for two days. We couldn't speak to our families. We couldn't speak to our lawyers. And we couldn't even take a shower. Uh, ICE has been releasing Spanish uh, asylum seekers every other week. In the 10 months, they have only released seven, uh, only seven Africans in the 10 months. That is, that is quite unfair. When we go to court, one of the points that the judge to talk about us is that we are criminals. But I believe none of us here have any criminal records. But the judge keeps saying that we are criminals.
You don't believe what we are saying. So we are pleading with the people outside, all the NGOs, all the NGOs, South of Poverty, or the Congress people, please, the, the United States as a whole, we beg you people to help us in here. Help us in here. We are dying. We are dying for real. I don't know how many of y'all, that was the first time that you've seen inside of a detention center or heard someone's actual I voice. Any of that controversy um, and all YouTube the parties is still today. Today. <laughs> Oh, a preview for the presidential debate. Hmm. Um, anyways, uh, I don't know if that has been any of y'all's first time to, to hear someone's real voice. Uh, speaking out against the atrocities that are being uh, committed against them by our government, but I know for me it's always a difficult thing to watch and to hear because, like I said at the beginning, this is a real person. This could be your father, this could have been your son, this could have been your boyfriend. My mother, or I'm sorry, my grandmother was born in Poland and during the Holocaust she fled from Poland to France because they wanted her father to become a Nazi soldier and he said, no, I'm not going to do that. And they fled to France where they found safety. And so that is a personal story in my family's history as far as this was, this isn't generations removed. This is my immediate family that had an opportunity to, to start a new life somewhere instead of staying in their home country and being killed. And so I think when we can find those similarities, that those are things that will propel us to create a better world for all of us to live in. Now, on a good day, someone is released from one of these detention centers. Unfortunately, today, nobody was released, but on a good day, someone is released. And that's where Casa de Paz comes alongside folks like this young man, Juan, who was released from the detention center. And we are standing alongside them as they make that transition from detention to their final destination in the United States. Because oftentimes when you arrive at the southern border and you lawfully present yourself to Border Patrol asking for asylum, you are taken into custody of ICE and put into a detention center. It doesn't really matter where you have friends or family or sponsors living, they just put you wherever they wanna put you. So you may end up here in Colorado, even though you've never been to Colorado, you've never heard of Colorado, and your family may live in Minnesota, or your friends may live in Florida, or your sponsor lives in Washington state. You just ended up getting shipped here. But you're released on a good day, right? And you're free. Well, how do you get to your next stop? That's where we come into play. And that's how DU students have joined us in the effort to welcome immigrants to the United States. So we have volunteers that go to the detention center to pick up folks who've been released. We also, because of COVID, have sort of upped our hospitality game and tried to make that transition from the detention center to Casa de Paz a little smoother. And so one of the ways that we're doing that now instead of having folks wait in the lobby after they've been released, waiting for a volunteer to come pick them up, we have purchased this van, we've converted it to be a comfortable living room, and now our volunteers are there throughout the day. So as soon as someone is released from the detention center, boom, we're there right away to greet them, welcome them, tell them we're happy that they're here, and start making travel plans to get them home. We arrive at Casa de Paz and we have dinner together. You can see that we're outside on the deck because the detention center, I know I'm using the word detention center, but it is absolutely a prison. And in cases it's even worse than a prison. At this detention center, you can not look outside. I'm looking outside my window right now, but at the detention center, the windows are blacked out. You cannot look outside. You cannot see the sky. You cannot see the trees. You cannot feel the sun on your skin. And so when folks are released, of course we wanna sit outside and enjoy the simplicity and beautiful nature that Colorado has to provide. Then if folks need overnight shelter, we have a very simple home. It's just a normal three bedroom, two bath home in a normal neighborhood, but we provide shelter so that folks aren't sleeping on the streets in an unfamiliar city uh, as their you know, impression, first impression of the United States. And then, 
once they've got a plane ticket or a bus ticket to get home, wherever it is that they're headed to, our volunteers, such as Carly right here, who I'm about to introduce to y'all, take them to the airport. And we don't just drop off folks to the airport or to the bus station. We walk inside there with them. We make sure they get their tickets. We make sure they get through security. We make sure they get to their gate. So there's no confusion, nobody's getting lost. So these are very simple things that we can do to rewrite the narrative, right? And to be remembered for a country that is welcoming of immigrants of all nationalities, of all colors. And for me, I personally do this kind of work because I truly believe that families belong together. And when I see pictures like this, these are two parents who were detained here in Aurora, Colorado and were separated from their children. But when I see these pictures of families being reunited, no matter how hard of a day I've had, no matter how long of a day or how difficult it was to hear someone tell me their story of fleeing trauma and then coming to the United States and then another trauma, right, of being detained and then another trauma of being locked up for over a year or two years or three years, whatever the case, th those are long, hard days. But when I see families like this being put back together again, totally worth it. Do it. I'm ready to do it the next day. And Dr. Crystal Jones says, this is one of my favorite quotes. She says, there's a difference between all are welcome and this was created with you in mind. And one of the folks that's creating a community that's more welcoming of immigrants is a former DU student, Carly. Uh, she's here in the middle. You can see her with her group of fellow DU students um, who completed their service learning um, uh, hours with Casa de Paz. And she has just been such a bright spot, uh, not only in my life personally, but in the lives of immigrants who've been released from the detention center, in the lives of our volunteers that come alongside folks to, um, to provide that hospitality. Uh, she's always so cheerful and kind and silly and goofy and I remember specifically one day we had a volunteer training we're all volunteers we're volunteer run and led and so we had this really big volunteer training and um Carly gets up and and I asked her spur of the moment I said normally we take a five or ten minute break but with hundreds of people in the audience it's going to be impossible for us to, you know, stand up and move around and then come back in five to 10 minutes. So Carly, will you please lead us in some yoga stretches? And she just rolled with the punches. She said, absolutely. She gets up there in front of hundreds of people, starts doing some yoga movements and understands the importance of, you know, moving our body in the midst of all of this. So I'm just very excited to um, introduce Carly, um, one of my favorite people in the world. And so Carly, I'm handing it over to you. Hi, thank you, Sarah, um, for such a warm introduction and for always sharing that yoga story. I will uh, never live that down. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen real fast. Everyone else did it so quickly. Okay, um, so my name is Carly Howenstein. Um, I just first of all wanna say thank you so much um, to Professor Escobedo for inviting me to partake in this Livingston lecture. It's such an honor to be here. Um, I was a student at the University of Denver. I graduated last year in 2019 with my major in international studies in Spanish with a minor in sociology. Um, and currently I am a legal assistant at the Rocky Mountain Immigrant Advocacy Network. Uh, so I'm gonna start with just talking a little bit about my story going from DU to volunteering with Casa de Paz and now working uh, still in immigration in a different sense in the, in the legal realm. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit more about why this work is important to me and why you all should be interested in it as well. And then I'm also gonna talk a little bit about race today and how race plays a role in immigration uh, today. And I'm gonna try to do that all in about 15 minutes. So let's go. <laughs> um, okay, so first of all, uh, my story, or actually I actually have a question for all of you. And I hope you're all awake and can use the chat box because please post your answers in the chat box. So my first question is before tonight, 
how many of you knew that there was an immigration detention center here in Aurora, Colorado, uh, just 30 minutes from DU's campus? If you wanna share your answers, go ahead. I would love that. Um, so, some of you knew this, some of you did not. Oh, lots of, lots of answers coming in. So some people knew, some people did not. Me two years ago, I did not know that there was an immigration detention center in Colorado. I didn't know what immigration detention was. And I certainly did not know that there was one so close to where I was studying and living. Um, that all changed in winter quarter 2019 when I signed up for a class called Deportation Nation with Professor Lisa Martinez. Uh, she, this was not a normal sociology class. This is not a normal class because it had a service learning component. And that service learning component was as um, Professor Scoville and Sarah have talked about, uh, volunteering with Casa de Plus. So during that quarter, I got the opportunity to volunteer with Casa de Plus for um, probably about 20 hours throughout those 10 weeks. And it completely changed my life. Um, I learned so much and I would not be doing what I'm doing today without that experience. Uh, so I'm gonna talk first about just a, um, my first volunteer experience with Casa de Plus and kind of what that uh, meant for me. And then, yeah, go from there. Um, if I can change the slide, that would be helpful. Okay, so uh, my very first volunteer experience with Casa de Plus was about two weeks after at the beginning of the class and I actually volunteered for the first time with the visitation program and what the visitation program does is they go into the detention center or did pre-COVID to visit with detainees and just provide conversation and companionship to people who are being locked up for lord knows how long. Uh, so I showed up there and walked inside in the de detention center, signed in, sat down. About 30 minutes later, they call their group back and I walked through a metal detector and then two locked doors into a room that was basically a long hallway. I sat down on a metal stool and picked up the phone. There is an immigrant, uh, we're gonna call him Jay just for confidentiality purposes, sitting across from me. Uh, there was plexiglass between us. We both had phones. Some of the sometimes the phones don't work. Uh, sometimes they're super gargly and really hard to hear, and you just have to deal with it for your hour-long visitation. Uh, luckily, this day the phones were working fine, and I talked to Jay for an hour. Uh, I was pretty nervous and apprehensive going in there, just because I didn't know what we would talk about. I didn't know if he wanted to be talking to me. Uh, I was just kind of had to go for it, and he ended up being just the nicest person ever. We had a fantastic conversation. He's just a very kind soul. And during that conversation, we talked about everything from our favorite books to our favorite food. Uh, he told me that he absolutely loves coffee and he would work in the detention center for very low wages just to be able to every Sunday morning from the commissary buy a cafecito and drink his coffee and just feel some semblance of um, comfort. Also in that conversation, he told me why he was here in the United States and uh, why he was in immigration detention. And he was actually fleeing his home country. He was an asylum seeker and he was fleeing because his home government had assassinated every member of his family. And I mean every single member. And somehow he got away and he was able to escape and he left the country, he came to the United States and he was asking for asylum. So this is a man that has been through more than you or I hopefully could ever imagine. And he gets to the United States and immediately they lock him up. And that really hit me hard. So, you know, we've, we wrapped up our conversation. It was a fantastic hour. The hour passed way too quickly. And I, I left and I walked out of the detention center um, because I was allowed to leave, whereas he was not. And really just had a flood of emotions. Um, I didn't really know how to feel. I felt warm and happy because he was so kind and compassionate. And I felt really mad and angry because I didn't understand why he was being treated like a criminal when he was just trying to literally save his life. So that really bothered me. 
And I had several other experiences like this, hearing similar stories throughout my time volunteering with Casa de Paz uh, during that service learning component. So then um, after, after the class, I was actually given the opportunity to have an internship with Casa. And this was another fantastic experience where I was able to meet so many strong, interesting people that just did not deserve to be locked up. And everything that I learned continued to illuminate the dehumanizing aspects of the detention and deportation systems in the United States. Uh, so this is me uh, out in front of the Casa de Paz. And then this is a photo of one of the volunteer trainings that I was at. And uh, there were about, I think that was one of the biggest ones. There were about 200 attendees. Sarah could probably give you the exact number, but. <laughs> um, so then after uh, interning with Casa de Paz for about six months, there was a job posting with the Rocky Mountain Immigrant Advocacy Network that I applied for and got. And so the Rocky Mountain Immigrant Advocacy Network or REMAIN um, is an organization that provides free legal um, or free immigration legal services to immigrant children and to adults in immigration detention. And I specifically work on the side that um, provides legal services to adults in immigration detention. And I really saw this job as an opportunity to further serve the non-citizen immigrant popula population and also learn more about the um, immigrant system. So now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about you know, why I care about immigration detention and why you should care as well, um, or why we should all care. So this is a um, word cloud using the word immigration. And I'm gonna go ahead and use the chat box again. So please write in the chat box any word that you see here that has a positive connotation. And let's, I'll give it a, just a second to see if any, any words are coming in. Okay, I see security, visa, citizenship, homeland, citizenship, overhaul, uh, company, naturalization, reform, jobs, individual, travel, reform, travel, green, amnesty. Okay, um, so yes, those are all fairly positive words. I would say they're all fairly neutral words, but I would say for the, in my opinion, and the, for the most part, when I see most of these words, they have fairly negative con connotations, such as illegal, uh, security, uh, control, um, undocumented, um, border enforcement, fence, uh, deportation. So I bill, I, you know, uh, yeah, foreign. So I would say a lot of these words have uh, very negative connotations. And I think this is the idea that we have when we think of immigration, because this is how immigration is talked about in a political sphere. Um, but after volunteering with Casa de Paz and now working at Remain, that is not the makeup of immigration. That's not what immigration is. Immigration is not policy. Immigration is people. And I think that's what we really need to focus on to get to a better immigrate, a better place in the whole system of immigration. Uh, so here, I would say this is immigration in practice. Here you can see real life suffering and uh, fear. You see families being separated. You see people being called things like illegals and aliens. You see hard workers being uh, humiliated and taken away in handcuffs from their job. You see people being locked in cages, literal cages. Uh, and this is not the way that, in my opinion, anyone deserves to be treated. And I think we really need to shift the conversation away from um, the, the negativity associated with immigration and look at the human being and see, okay, well, what can we do to make sure that we are not treating humans like this? Um, okay, so these are just some little facts that I've put together. Um, that, yeah, so what makes immigration detention uh, inhumane or unjust? And these are some facts that I didn't know until more recently uh, working at Remain. And so I'm just gonna go ahead and read through these and um, yeah. So in immigration proceedings, so in their court hearings, if a person cannot afford an attorney, they must represent themselves in front of the judge and against the government attorneys. Uh, so in criminal cases, people are given public defenders, but in immigration cases, because they are not citizens, they're not afforded uh, 
like a public defender or free representation, even if they can't afford it. And so people who are coming from other countries literally have to craft their own legal argument and defend themselves in front of an immigration judge and uh, the government attorneys, which is not a just system. Um, also private detention facilities, as Sarah mentioned, are paid per detainee per day. This means that they are fiscally motivated to detain as many people as possible in the cheapest conditions. And I use the term cheapest conditions uh, because the less money the detention center, or yeah, the less money the detention center spends on upkeep and immigration or immigrant care, uh, the more money they get to pocket for themselves. So what this ends up looking like oftentimes is that uh, they're served food that is not very fresh. They have insufficient health care. Uh, there's infrequent cleaning or the detainees have to do the cleaning for themselves with insufficient cleaning products. And uh, amidst this global pandemic, there has been a lack of PPE as well. Um, people are often detained for months or years as they await a decision on their case. So if someone is subject to mandatory detention or they are not given a bond or parole, they have to wait in detention until their case concludes. And that can sometimes take, like it says here, months or years, um, depending on the, the facts of the case. And there's often a lot of discrepancy in immigration cases, allowing the judge to make the final decision. Uh, this is a huge disadvantage for people being detained in more conservative areas. So in, in immigration cases, in most immigration cases, there is a lot of discrepancy um, in the case, allowing the judge to really make the decision based off what they want to see. Um, there's a lot of room for interpretation in the law. And so the judges have a lot of leeway, not to mention these people are oftentimes representing, representing themselves. So uh, like I said, in more conservative areas, um, especially in parts of the South in super rural areas where there are detention centers, um, this is a huge disadvantage for uh, detained immigrants because um, the, the judge really has a lot of, of decision-making power. Okay, so I'm gonna switch gears one more time. Uh, we're almost done and talk about a little bit more about race uh, within the immigration detention deportation system. So this is something that Professor Escobedo talked about and I wanna talk about it a little bit in terms of today and um, you know what's going on in, in our world today. So this is a quote from the Black Alliance for Just Immigration that says immigrants are exposed to more risk and vulnerability when they are stopped by the police for minor offenses, such as broken taillights and traffic violations. So, um, as you can see, so as, as you know, Black and Latino communities are often subjected to over-policing. Um, and a study at Stanford University concluded that Black drivers um, are 20% more likely to be pulled over than white drivers. So when you combine this, that, um, that black immigrants, this is talking specifically about black immigrants, but usually um, race minorities in general, when you combine that they are being over-policed and pulled over more often and stopped by law enforcement more often with the fact that police and law enforcement in the justice system are working very closely oftentimes with ICE to turn people over into the immigration system, what you get is a lot more um, racial minorities being detained and put into immigration proceedings than you see um, of like white immigrants being put into these immigration proceedings. Um, and this next graph shows a little bit more about black immigrants. It says that they are at a greater risk for uh, deportation. So the, on the left side, you can see that um, it, Black immigrants make up 7.2% of non-citizens, yet they make up 20.3% of non-citizens facing deportation on criminal grounds. So that's a huge discrepancy uh, that doesn't totally um, make sense and just shows the injustice that is existing here when it comes to race and immigration. Um, and then I do wanna talk a little bit more about what this uh, criminal grounds means. So in this graph, you can see it's the leading crime categories of convicted criminal aliens removed. And again, this is often a lot of propaganda that is used in the political sphere, um, saying that, 
oh, we're only deporting criminals. Uh, immigrants are criminals, we're deporting criminals. Um, so it's important to understand what that criminal statement means and this breaks it down a little bit. As you can see, 24% of that criminal conviction is actually immigration related. And what that means is that um, for immigrants, simply being in the country, if they're undocumented uh, or if they don't have proper documentation is a crime against the US government. So out of um, everyone being removed or deported um, with a criminal background, 24% of that criminal background is simply being here um, against the law because that's a criminal, uh, that's criminalized uh, against the United States. Another 23% is strictly traffic violations. So uh, as Professor Escobedo was talking about earlier, potential, um, you know, taillights being out, uh, speeding tickets, driving without a license, stuff like that. And then another 21% is drug related, and that could be simply marijuana possession. So I think when we were talking about, you know, deporting criminals, it's really important to understand what that means and um, where, what the, what is criminalized uh, in the immigration context. So it's a lot of information in a short time, and I know we could go into all of that in so much more detail, but I do just want to leave you with one final question. And that is, what if this is what if this was you or your parent? How would you want them to be treated? So again, I think we really need to move away from the context uh, that immigration is spoken about in politics and focus on the, the human being that is being affected and how should we be treating them because they don't deserve what they're getting from our government. And now I'm going to pass it back over to Professor Escobedo for um, the Q&A. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much, Carly and Sarah. We very much appreciate you sharing your expertise with us today. And we do have a number of questions coming in um, that we have time for. I wanted to start out, this question um, is for Sarah. Um, Sarah, in your time organizing Casa de Paz, have you seen important changes in immigration detention? And relatedly, were there changes you made over time to the way Casa de Paz then operated? Actually, I'll start with the second question first. I originally started Casa de Paz as a hospitality home for immigrants who, um, for families of immigrants who were locked up. So sort of like the Ronald McDonald home where families stay at a place while their children are in a hospital getting medical care. I started Casa de Paz as a home for families of detained immigrants to have a place to stay when they were coming in from out of town to visit their loved one who was locked up. Uh, and then we still have space for families to stay, but we've added the post-release support uh, program and also our visitation program, like Carly mentioned, just because we were there and we noticed the need. And actually the ICE officers called us for our very first person who was released from the detention center. They called us and said, hey, we're releasing someone from detention. She just won her asylum. It's the middle of a blizzard and her family is in Mississippi. Could you come and pick her up? I know that you have a house right across this or an apartment right across the street. So that wasn't even in our plan. Um, so yeah, that that's kind of a little bit of the shifting of the, the CASA programming. And then as far as immigrant detention goes, I mean, I think what I'm seeing right now currently is obviously just a complete lack of medical care. At this detention center, there is now I think it's their second or their third outbreak of COVID. So there are over 100 people in this facility that have contracted COVID, including an entire pod, which is about 30 people at this point. Um, and we are in contact with folks who are detained through our, our, our visitation program that's now a pen pal slash video phone call program. We're in contact with folks who are detained and they're saying things like, I'm, I'm in a pod with 30 other people. We all have COVID, we're all sick. We're all requesting to get medical attention and nobody is doing anything about it. They're telling us to drink water and to, to, to walk it off. 
And so I think what I have noticed personally from being in this kind of space for the past eight years is just the medical care is just getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And now during a pandemic, there's no reason to hold an asylum seeker who has not committed a crime in a prison during a pandemic. And in fact, we, Casa de Paz, were just part of, we were witness uh, witnesses in a lawsuit where the state of California sued ICE in order to release folks from a detention center there. Um, and the, the judge ordered ICE to release all of the asylum seekers that are being held in this detention center saying there's absolutely no reason that this should happen, especially during a pandemic. Um, yeah. Thank you. This question, I, either of you, I, I, I'd be happy for you to weigh in. I think there um, is some, some question about how these private detention facilities came about, who's paying for them, um, and, and why exactly are they so profitable? Carly, do you wanna? I can take a stab at it and you can uh, do any follow-up. Um, the answer to who's paying for these is it's the, the federal government. Um, so the Department of Homeland Security um, which ICE is under, um, actually pays, contracts out and pays these detention facilities to house immigrants. Uh, it's a very similar system to the um, criminal prison system that we have in the United States. I don't know why that makes the most sense to have private versus public prisons. So Sarah, you can uh, respond to that if you want. But I will also say that um, another interesting fact is that um, the Department of Justice on the other side, which is also part of the federal government, uh, funds a lot of organizations um, such as Remain uh, or, you know, funds funders that fund Remain to provide legal services. So it's kind of interesting. They won't provide um, actual representation for people. But meanwhile, while they're detaining people, they're also kind of funding um, representation in some ways. So it just is a really backward system. Yep, I think what I'll add is the the financial incentive for these for profit prisons. When you have a for profit prison, you're making money. You're ma you're making profit, and so the more mo money that you can make, the richer you will become. And under when um, there's two main prison companies that detain immigrants in immigrant detention centers, Core Civic and Geo is is the second one. The day after Trump got elected, those stocks shot up, shot up. And not by like 5%, like over 30 and 40%. Because people knew that this was going to be a money-making business. And when you take out the financial incentive, then you know we can have a more decent conversation, I think. Although I don't believe immigrant detention needs to even exist, but I think taking out the financial incentive, and, and, and Carly mentioned that earlier, the cheaper that they can detain someone results in a bigger paycheck at the end of the day for the CEO, for the board member, whoever. And so that's why things like medical care or the food that they're, that they're given. Uh, and, and I also would like to mention too that the a lot of the work that's done inside the detention center, the cooking, the cleaning, that's all done by detained immigrants. And they are working for eight 10 hours a day, and they're being compensated $1 a day for that work. There's actually a class action lawsuit against GEO right now for forced labor because immigrants were being told, you have to do these jobs, and if you don't, we're putting you in solitary confinement. That is called slavery. So hence the class action lawsuit. And one thing I've, I've learned in, in teaching this class and, and thinking more and more about the role of these private immigration detention centers is just how much these centers mean to the small towns that they are a part of. They're often in very far away places purposefully, right? Um, so they're hard to get to, they're hard to be on people's radar in terms of the human rights abuses, um, but they are also major employers for these small towns, right? And so a number of, of guards and individuals that work in the facilities wouldn't be able to find employment elsewhere. Um, 
there are a number of other questions coming in, but unfortunately we are at 626 and um, we want to leave you with some parting words. So um, I, I, I just want to thank you all for coming tonight. I want to thank Carly and Sarah uh, just for your immense talent and generosity and for empowering our students and, and your volunteers to be um, active change agents in, in improving the society we live in. It's incredibly inspiring. Um, we will plan on sending out a post webinar email in the coming days with information about Casa de Paz, about Remain. I see some comments here about individuals who are interested in providing some, some support financially for, for these institutions. So thank you for that. We will provide you with that information. Sarah also has a new book on her journey starting Casa de Paz and running it. It is called The House That Love Built. So please check it out. And again, that information will be in our, our parting email. Um, and finally, please feel free to, to reach out to any of us before, um, you, you know, that are after the program, if you have questions in the future. Um, I'd now like to turn the stage over to Provost Mary Clark. We're so honored that she's here with us tonight and she would like to say a few words and then close out our event. Thank you, Liz, and thank you, Liz, Sarah, and Carly for this extraordinarily thoughtful, uh, compelling program. Uh, thank you, Liz, for your uh, exceptionally thoughtful historical narrative. Uh, and to Sarah and Carly for all the work that you do uh, in this area. Uh, thank you, it's uh, extraordinarily important work. Um, thank you also to Nancy Livingston uh, for sponsoring tonight's lecture in honor of your beloved husband. It's an important venue for highlighting the work of our faculty and their expertise and their work with students as was demonstrated by this evening's program. Liz and Sarah and Carly spoke very movingly of the profoundly degrading nature of US immigration policy. As someone who has participated as a lawyer in the representation of individuals in detention centers, I've seen the enormous human impacts uh, of our detention policy. Uh, Liz and Sarah and Carly have spoken to the intensely dehumanizing nature of these detention centers, the jumpsuits uh, that presume everyone uh, is a criminal, uh, the lack of sunshine and natural light, the uh, poor diet, uh, the lack of human contact. Uh, it's a highly degrading uh, institution. I'm also mindful uh, just yesterday of the heartbreaking news that we all learned of the 450 children who were detained at our border and separated from their parents uh, by our government. Uh, and now we're unable to locate their parents. Uh, and so uh, just um, mindful uh, of the impacts of our immigration policy on real uh, human lives. Um, so thank you again to all who have joined us this evening uh, and to our panelists again uh, for this uh, compelling uh, presentation on a critical matter. Thank you, and I look forward to next year's Livingston Lecture. <laughs>